All right, so we'll, you know what, we'll just go ahead and get started now. So, all right, my name is Tony Karkama. Welcome, everyone. I'm president of Civil Cat Learning Solutions, and I'm also president of the uh, 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 DFW BIM Infrastructure User Group. So, uh, today's guest, today we have a webinar over Revit, uh, optimizing Revit family de uh, development. So, our guest is Christina. So, Christina, if you want to take it over. Oh, thank you, Tony. So yeah. my name is Christina Youngblood, and I have been a Revit developer for about 18 years uh, with specializing in Revit family development for manufacturers uh, and working along with content aggregators in, uh, in the AOC and AEC industry. Uh, so today, this uh, I'd like to just kind of go over some uh, tools and um, techniques that I use when I'm developing my Revit families and things that I consider to hopefully help get you guys uh, producing long-lasting content that's going to uh, stay with you for the lifetime of your, uh, of your de development. Um, uh, did you just want me to get straight into the whole conversation or? <laughs> You're muted, so I'm going to say yes. You're still smiling. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, before any project starts, the first thing that we always do is planning and understanding what we are looking to develop. So that is how I that's how I start, and uh, that's how the direction that I'm going to take this conversation. Um, so what what are you creating? Which family are you creating? And that's a big question on itself because in Revit, everything has its place and everything has its requirements. So are you creating a window or a door or are you creating a wall, a curtain wall system? Um, do you need a material or pattern? Everything has uh, a requirement. So understanding what you are looking to create uh, is always the first stage. And then understanding Revit's requirements for that product. So um, let's say we're going to create a window. Uh, you know, it's, it needs to be dynamic. I need to be able to size it based on width and height. How does it interact with the building? So there is a building interaction. So, you know, there'd probably be detail components. That's another file. And windows and doors are usually made up of frames and profiles. So those are other components that Revit contains that you can consider when, when developing your models. So understanding those requirements will allow you to better prepare for your future development. Um, and then we get into the product types. So again, materials, patterns, multi-layer families, multi-component families, and there's so many different types. So like a multi-layer family would be a window where I need multiple things just to make that one, one model. But then a multi-component family might be something more complex like um, an exterior lamp fixture that has a base, a post, um, the luminaire arms, and then the luminaire itself. Those are all individual components that are required to create that. So again, plan, consider your options prior to starting. Um, and then once you have all that information, you can get, uh, you can start working on your actual Revit model itself. Um, so Revit, I'm just going to, hold on, making sure I have my right note here. Um, so other things to consider is how will it be used? So is this something that is going to be in a project that you need to deliver to people or is this something personal because the requirements will change? If you need to have this as a project to release to others, then you need to consider those building interactions. You need scheduling, you need to consider the data that is being implanted into that model and how it's going to be used and how it is uh, manipulated based on that model itself. So that window or something. Um, so moving on from there, you have an idea of what you're going to create, where you're going to go. So the next thing that you're going to do is select the appropriate template. So Revit has, and I, can I share my screen? Um, which, oh, there it is. Sorry. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go into Revit here. Okay. So that's, uh, so finding your template. So when you're starting a new family, um, you know, Revit has a repository of content that you can, can use in Imperial and metric. So make sure that you use the appropriate template. And this is always a starting point. You should always start here, but I take it a, next, a step further. So uh, the, again, that's why we're here today to have this conversation. So let's say we're going to do um, uh, 
you see that we have columns, curtain wall panels, generic modeling. So find what best suits your product and start from there. I'm just going to go to the generic model just to keep this simple. And you can see that these models are very basic. There's only um, there's only two reference planes and they're both labeled as centered. If I go into the property types, there's not very much information, just very basic. And this does change based on the template that you select. There might be more or less options based on what you select, but this is just a very out of the box template from Revit. So I like to start setting up the basis for whatever uh, I am creating. So I know that there's gonna be left and right planes. So making sure that I pre-set up some of that information. So we can just go and add some dimensions here and making sure that I label everything. So this is the preliminary template setup. So I am taking the Revit's, Revit's template and I'm now adding my first level. I know this is gonna be for, um, let's say a chair furniture. So I know that there's gonna be basic information required it required for it. How high is it? The seat level, um, where the arms are gonna go, something to do with the furniture. So you put that information in here and, uh, and making sure that you apply the appropriate reference planes and reference lines. Um, so things about reference lines, those are defined those are defined references with a defined start and end point. So if you need something with um, an A to B point on it, then you would use a reference line because you, you're telling it where to start and you're telling it where to end. But if you have something that's more general, a, um, uh, a plane for lines and geometry, that's where the reference planes come in because they are not defined by a length uh, from an A to B, they're defined for a position. So we have this one foot dimension that's going here, but I can change this now. If it would let me have it, there we go. And you can see that it moves. So with a reference, with a reference um, line, sorry, <laughs> get tongue tied there. Uh, you're defining as A to B positioning. So I'm not saying this is offset two feet. I'm saying that with a reference, um, with a reference line, you're saying that the total length would be two feet. So those are the difference between the two of them. Uh, and then making sure that I label them appropriately and setting my references. So this is just you know standard Revit um, techniques that we use in Revit family development and uh, making sure that you, you cover these in your template would be helps you set up for better pro, uh, better development in the future. So now I don't need to know where my left hand plane is, my right plane, top, bottom, uh, front or back. It would always de be defined in my template because Revit doesn't provide those in their default. So that's always the first step in me creating my own Revit family uh, templates and uh, models. I start with creating what I need as the bare bones. Um, I move on to um, parameters and um, under family types. And this is another important thing to consider, making sure that you use appropriate names. Don't come up with something that no one is gonna understand, you know, TBS or uh, one five dash, whatever you're making up, make sure it is appropriate. So if you are using width and length, that can be used in multiple places. So is this the unit's width and length or is this um, the arm's width and length? Trying to find your parameters in an easy to read format for not only for your template, but moving forward. So if I hand this model off to somebody else, would they understand how to use it? We don't need a rocket scientist to be able to read this content. You want people to be able to easily use and manipulate this work. So just think ahead, plan and um, use common terminology. Um, abbreviations are okay, but again, the AEC industry has um, a very good repository of abbreviative forms for, for words. So go look those up. Use what the industry is using so that if somebody else needs to find out what that word is, what those, what those letters stand for, that they'd be able to find what it is and not try and figure out what you might have been thinking that day. Uh, that's the biggest um, that's the most important thing when developing Revit families is considering the industry's use and how those files are used globally uh, will help you develop better models. Um, I also like 
to uh, review my parameters and my dimensions prior to um, developing. So what do I know needs to be dimensioned? What values need to be parametric, which can be static? Again, proper planning is going to make this entire uh, process a lot easier for you. Um, sorry, first first webinar is <laughs> still directing myself. <laughs> oh, oh, good. Yeah, it was good. Good. Uh, I have a quick question. I mean, I'm, of I'm, course. A, I'm a beginner Revit. And so if you're building this de development, and I mean, it might be a dumb question is, do you have to do this for every version or can you carry it over to the next version? You can carry it over to, ne to the next version. So I actually have templates that I've been using since um, they started in 2012, mm -hmm. uh, the templates that I created, but I've been evolving them over the years. So okay. things that I've learned, uh, I've worked with the AAC industry and users. So people have been providing me feedback and comments on how to use this, how they use the files, what issues they ran into. So I modify my templates as I go. So the okay. next model is better, but it does upgrade. There are some changes Revit puts in, but that's just like any other platform. There mm -hmm. might be... Um, there might be some slight changes you need to put in place, but honestly, the last few years, bare, barely anything. Um, you do need to upgrade the models, which is just opening and resaving them in the newest okay. version. Um, and I do keep a repository of past templates as well, because sometimes somebody might come and say, I can only use this. And those files are compatible with newer versions, but you cannot downsave. Yeah. So just again, planning and thinking ahead, what is this model going to be used for? Who's using it? Uh, we'll make sure that you're in the right direction. But yes, you can reuse the content. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so once I have my template built, um, I know what I want to create. Uh, this is a more complex <laughs> system, then it's looking into the elements that I'm going to be used in here. So if I go and select this one object, you can see that this is a nested panel for a door because I actually require multiple door panels. So this one is a glass panel. I have some that are solid wood. I have some with some inlays. Uh, and this way, my door family doesn't need to change and I can use my nested families, another panel and put it in there. And as long as I've set up my template correctly, then these models um, can be utilized and adjusted within this parent, this parent family, um, this family template. Uh, and things that I consider uh, would be, so, you know, materials and finishes requirements for this. So you don't need everything for the door because that's not what this is. This is just the panel. Somebody else can make this. Uh, what is required for, for this product? Um, so again, pre-planning has really allowed me to um, develop something that would is self-sufficient, but can be in, um, integrated into a family, into a parent. Um, just make sure I'm on the right track here. Um, and once you build your templates, before I even get to this stage, so at this level, say we've done all of our dimensioning, we have a good um, template set up. I actually save at this stage, uh, and I save it as a as the first family template because I don't want to have to go and do those reference planes again. I'm pretty sure nobody else wants to repeat putting in the same left-handed reference plane every single time. So stay, save at this stage because you can actually use this for multiple product type family templates. So uh, not just furniture, maybe appliances, uh, um, exterior specialties. So maybe like um, um, a garbage can or a bench or something like that. Again, you just... I develop my templates as I need to and go up. So then the next phase for this would be actually turning it into a specific family template. Now that I know I have this base done, I'm going to create it into a base furniture family template. Um, so when I save it as that, I know this is not complete. So thinking about naming. So we have this first one. This one would be uh, just the generic family template, but now we're into the family. So um, let's say that this is for furniture. I'd always start with furniture because that's how people are going to find it. What am I looking for? I'm looking for a piece of furniture. So this template will get them in the right direction. So proper naming conventions for your files, 
is also part of optimizing your Revit family development, because if you can't locate it, if it's not logical, then um, it's not going to make sense down the road as you expand and um, improve upon your content. So make sure you name your content accurately um, and and think about how it's how it's used. So this is furniture. So now from there is this seating or is this tables? Is this something else? So let's put seating here because uh, we know it's seating. Now what type of seating is this? Is this um, uh, is this interior or exterior? Uh, so I like to put that. That is not something everybody will put, but I do differentiate between interior and exterior seating or in interior and exterior products. So um, I put that as my title. Try not to put spaces in your names. Uh, this is just proper file format naming conventions. You can find it anywhere on the web, on the internet. Just look up, you know, um, file naming techniques or solutions. And there's usually a uh, a rhythm for how, how people name their files. So uh, I will go furniture, seating, exterior, bench, and, um, and then maybe this is backlist so that I can predefine. There might be other options as well because this might be specific to a style and you can put that in there as well. But you can see from the base setup of my naming that I would be able to easily find this in a repository, in a library of content and be able to be like, okay, I'm doing an exterior bench and I don't need a back. This model is already pre-set up for that. Um, so once you're at that stage where you've named your file, that's where you're going to get into um, specific geometry. Um, some things about adding in geometry, you don't want floating reference planes to start. Never just have a reference plane like this guy sitting off in space. Uh, that one just has a dimension. You never want a floating dimension name, name or a floating dimension plane. Um, and you also want to name all of your reference planes. That's really important because people can't find it when you're doing warnings and checking for issues. It um, it identifies, it'll help you identify under the warnings. Um, go. So I don't currently have any warnings. That's why I'm not getting anything at this moment. Uh, but under the warnings, it would identify which object is having the issue. And the more information you put into your model, the easier it is to read these warnings because um, any Revit user will know that uh, they don't provide a lot. And it's actually very difficult sometimes to find out what's going on unless you understand how to read and how to utilize that section. Um, and what other things do we need to consider? So shared parameters. So is this model something that needs to be specified in your project? Does it need the, does the data need to be extracted? Do I need to be able to see this data outside of this product? So let's say I have a... Um, a TV on the wall. There's not even a specification section for TVs. You just put that up. You can have shared parameters which um, allow you to view that data externally, but for maybe a wall system or a table or um, uh, a projection screen. Sorry, I'm looking around my office room right now at things that I could name off. And those things I would need to be able to extract the data for because I'm a third party, another discipline may need to utilize that information. So consider how you're setting up your parameters. Do they need to be shared? Do I need to be able to access that information outside of the model? Um, Visibility and views. So that's something I find most people don't consider. Uh, Revit is very intuitive. Uh, we all know that it's a 3D visual design software, but it also has the 2D aspects. You're in plan view, you can do elevations, and it looks it looks 2D in those views. So when you're building Revit models, Revit families, consider the visuals in each view needed. So if I have a, um, let's say, a stove, in Revit. Uh, sorry, of course it's Revit. <laughs> uh, let's say I have a stove. What does it need to look like in plan view? Because that's very different than what it needs to look like in front elevation, because you're actually going to see the uh, the stove's opening, the handles. You might see the, the screen to look into the stove, the glass. Uh, if I'm in plan view, I'm going to see the top with the burners. So those views are going to need to look different. Um, and making sure that your files are set up 
correctly in those views will make sure when you're in a project that the content looks appropriate and always test. If you draw something in plan view for your family, go into a project and make sure that it looks the way you want it to look because that circle that you put for your burner might not size correctly or might not be visible because it's turned off or its visibility is turned off and you don't notice. So always test your models in your projects and making sure that you um, that what you intend to be seen is actually being shown in your project. Uh, your components and geometry. Uh, so always lock, uh, always, what's the right word here? Constrain your geometry to a reference plane or uh, dimension it. It's best to put them to uh, reference planes because then they're they're easily constrained. Dim dimensions on a 3D object can sometimes be finicky, uh, but make sure you don't leave anything floating. That's a huge thing in Revit. Don't leave any floating objects. Uh, if you just have, let's just create a quick little extrusion here. And view bar is right my way, there it is. Okay, so we're, we've created a box unassociated to any object here. And you can see that I can pull this wherever I want. So this is an unconstrained, undefined geometry. It has no logic. But as soon as I associate it to a reference plane and I lock it, and there's multiple ways to do that, uh, now it is actually constrained to that reference plane. So I can move this one. And you can see that this side doesn't do anything because we haven't constrained it. And you can see that now that reference plane and that object are associated together. And if we do this side as well, then you can see that it moves in relation to where that reference plane is. So always constrain your objects. Don't leave anything floating. Uh, if you do need to have something that is defined, it doesn't have, it doesn't change, it doesn't do anything, you can consider the lock, the, uh, the pinning. Uh, that's the unpin just because I can't see everything here. Um, and you can pin an object, uh, but they're generally, you know, it's not something you generally like to do in families because um, it, it's not fully constraining your object. You The reference plane, your reference lines, your dimensioning, that's really the bread and butter of making sure that your model uh, is created and constrained the way that you intend it. Uh, when you have your project to a stage where you're like, yes, this is this is what I want. Um, this is what I wanna see. I'm just gonna make it look weird here for a second. If I save this as it is right now, my plot preview wouldn't look accurate. So part of Revit family development is all processes. So when I'm in a folder, an actual folder on my window, uh, Windows folder or your desktop, whatever you're using, the it's easier to find the content if you can actually see it. So Revit actually allows you to set things up. Um, so if I go and set up, let's say I wanna see it from this view and I want it at a slight angle. If you set up, um, you set your current view as home and save view, this actually will set your preview in your Revit model. So if we go to save, oops, that's family. Okay, sorry, that's a, all right. So if we go to options, so a few things in here. One, compact your file. It just reduces the file load, removes some of the uh, the garbage that's in there. And then under your thumbnail preview, you can actually select where you want your Revit to associate the preview for your thumbnail. So uh, that's why I set up my preview because I want it to show exactly what I intend. So when somebody looks at it, if they download my content or they're looking from through my library that they can, um, they know exactly what it looks like. If it's at a weird angle, you can't tell. You don't really know what's going on. So these small things allow you to make sure that um, your content is legible and easy to find and easy to use by others. So uh, I could just select okay and save. Um, there we go. And now this view would be the default for that preview. Uh, some other things that I do when I'm getting ready with a model. Uh, this model actually took me quite a long time to develop. This one's complex. It has a lot of parts and a lot of components. And actually, I worked on over five or six days. So when you're working on something that long, uh, I like to save in versions. There's some weird quirk in Revit that if um, you don't rename your file, it compounds the file size. 
a little bit. So uh, at the end of development for a day, I actually resave it and rename it and put a version at the end. You guys don't have to do that. That's just a technique that I use. It keeps my file size down and even very, very last model. So when I'm done this and I'm ready for production, I will resave it one last time, make sure the name is clean. Uh, and that will just ensure that a slight file size, I can't even tell you why. I wish I could. I wish I had logic of why this works. But uh, in some cases, it could be a small, just a few kilobytes. But in some cases, it could be a few hundred kilobytes. Again, no rhyme or reason. But just renaming your file at uh, strategic points will just help maintain and reduce your file size. And using that compact when you're doing your save as. Um, some other things that you can do are purging. Purging is actually very important uh, and should be done all the time, but this is a great example of how to be cautious and ensure that you don't delete things that you don't want. So if I go into here, you can see a lot of garbage, analytical surfaces, defaults, I don't need that stuff. But then I scroll down a little bit further and it's like, uh-oh, I have some materials in here that I do want to retain. I don't want these to go because they're just not an option being utilized in my model at this point. But Somebody in the future might want those materials. So just be careful when you're purging that you don't remove things you don't want. And this, ref this references nested families as well. You might have hardware in here, uh, but you might not be using all of the hardware. You might only need one component from that family, or maybe you don't. Maybe you want to delete the other things, but just be cautious when you're purging. You can easily just purge all and everything disappears, but then it's gone and you don't have that content anymore. So just uh, review and make sure that what you're gonna be removing from your file is exactly what you don't wanna be there. And again, saving afterwards so that uh, it will reduce your file size as you keep going. Um, something else I like to do is this preview visibility on. So uh, it's very hard to see that one just because this model doesn't have a lot. So if you look right here, I have a screen on this window, but when I go to preview visibility on, that screen disappears because I actually have this set to a visibility setting. I'll just go, <clears throat> I have a few in this one. This one's complex. Uh, and if it gets turned on or off is how it will show up in that visibility on. Because with Revit family um, models, it shows you everything all the time, even if it's on or off. You don't see it until you get into a project. That's why testing in a project is very important. But in Revit, you can at least do this preview visibility on and be like, all right, this is what I'm seeing. Uh, is this accurate? And it kind of gives you kind of a first level um, test prior to getting into a project, but you need to go into a project because they, they don't work the same. Um, I'd like to talk about imported geometry next. So, ne you know, this is for the people who want to take the EC route, I like to call it, uh, and importing external um, data. And Revit has made huge strides in making it not such a huge mess when you import geometry from other software, so uh, SolidWorks or um, AutoCAD or SketchUp. You can import a lot of content, but it does bring in a lot of backend garbage. Um, so instead of um, importing geometry, I like to link if possible. Uh, if you do need to import geometry and explode it, you need to be very di diligent at the end and making sure that all traces of it are removed. Otherwise, it could give you future issues with your model. Um, something might not work and it wouldn't even be your fault for the Revit family itself. It could just be something hidden in the background from another program um, that's causing it issues. It's very particular in how it likes to function. So just be careful. Uh, and when you're doing that, again, just, you know, you have your import, uh, but I really do like the link cat. If I'm just using it to trace geometry, because maybe it's something really unique and it's not a standard rectangle that I could just draw myself. I like to do it this way, trace over, and then I can remove it in, in its entirety. But if you import the CAD and you explode it, you're adhering it to your Revit model. So just be careful. It's not that you can't do it. It's just not recommended um, because of the issues that can come up from that. Um, and then revise your warnings. Uh, I, I get a lot of third-party content uh, to review. And these warnings 
are still up. And not everything can be um, can be resolved because it might be that you have multiple geometry in the same location because maybe you have an array or something like that. But anything that can be resolved, please look into it because if you're going to hand these models off to somebody else, you don't want them trying to deal with a problem only you know how to deal with. You can't generally pass on a model to somebody else to fix or or um, make changes to easily if you don't set it up correctly. And warnings can cause a lot of problems because they don't know the steps you took to create that model uh, in some cases. Like this door could be difficult for somebody else without experience to manipulate. Um, so we would like to resolve some of these, these issues if possible. Uh, so make sure you, you uh, make sure you purge, make sure you review your warnings and make sure you name your content accurately. Those will really allow your uh, development in the future to be more streamlined and uh, gives you those assurances that you know that you've met a certain threshold of standards for your content and everything from that point will meet that same threshold. Um, Another big thing is don't overmodel. It's very easily to it's very easy to do, and even this model would seem very complex because there's a lot of things going on. But in reality, everything is just rectangles, um, so you don't need all that extra detail, especially with windows and doors. How is this going to be used? Somebody's going to have a detail component that will have all of those profiles and other requirements for this project uh, for their sections. I don't need that in the 3D model. Consider your requirements for your model, how it interacts with the building, and develop to that level. You could go in here and do each frame exactly as a manufacturer would, but I don't recommend it. It just increases file size. It creates more opportunities for your content to break. Just you know, keep it simple. That it really is your best friend here is um, you know, not over, over modeling your content and making sure that um, it's easy to use. Um, and keep your file size as low as possible. That's not, that's easier said than done. You don't really have a control over that. Um, I can't say, no, I don't like 500 kilobytes, be 250, doesn't care. But I can consider things that I've loaded into the model. So if I see my file size going up and creeping, it's like, hmm, this is a simple model. What's going on? What do I need to look at? Maybe I've over modeled a component. I have too many, uh, I have too many faces on it and that aren't required. And so review, review your models, review your files as you're developing um, to, to ensure that you're creating something that you want to use in the future. 10 years, sorry, 10 years is a long time. Two years down the road, I need to get back to this model. Is it a mess? Can I reuse it? Can I? Can I make another product out of it? If you over model, if you over constrain, if you create a Frankenstein, no one, not even yourself is gonna to wanna to use that model. So think about how you would like to use this model moving forward and create something that's lifelong, a, a, a lifelong model, a lasting model. Uh, then when you get into, um, so the, I have this door. This one's a unique one. I actually have a version back from this, which is just a solid panel door, doesn't even have grills. So I use that model to create to create this new door. I'm creating a, now a uniquely specific door system with a glass panel and grills. Um, that Once you have your main family, I know I have a three panel door. I really like how it works, it flexes. Now I can take it to this next step. Now I can special, or. Um, be more specific in my components, in my nested families. I'm uh, just gonna actually show some of those here. So I actually have um, the, the swing operations. Uh, let's go to interior. So you can see that this one's on here. I will just turn on visibility. So before I had visibility on, you can see that there was two opening types because the door could open from the left or the right. So this one is showing one direction over the other, but here, when visibility is off in Revit family, um, development when you're modeling, it shows you everything. So again, this is such a great little feature. Just change your preview visibility to on and then you will see what you want to see. But when you're developing, you need it off because you need to see everything that's associated to it. Um, so this is actually a 2D object that I have on my elevation because I only want it to show up in this view. I only want it to show up when somebody's in an elevation. But if I go to my plan view, then I have a different 
2D detail that I would like to see. So I had to stop and think about how I was going to use this model. What was the requirement of this? This is actually a sliding folding door. So part of this unit slides. So I have an object that identifies how and where that works. And also you can see where the placement of the objects are. And then the doors themselves, these can be left or right opening. So there's visibility control set to that. So this one only shows when it's a right-hand swing. Uh, and let's turn our visibility back on. And so we can see that the right-hand swing has stayed, has stayed on because that's what I have selected. Um, and if I was bringing this in from the parent family, and now we are into this specific model, there might be stuff I don't need any longer. Um, this panel, let's see if I have anything. So I have a full, no, so I, I have already deleted it. I should have left it in there. Um, I had another nested panel that was a full wood panel, just a, just a solid wood panel. So I've deleted that from here because that's not what this model is. This model is specific to the uh, full glass unit. Uh, so just consider the template um, defaults that you have in there, clean it up, remove anything that's not needed. If something is needed, because it's an option, leave it in there and make sure you don't purge it out. Big things, don't purge it out. Um, how, are you, how are you maintaining this content? Uh, I've developed this beautiful library, this beautiful content library. I want to use it um, continuously, but how am I going to find it? Uh, are you on a network? Do you have a centralized location for your files? That's really, really important and actually might, should be considered in the pre-planning stages of where you're going to store and um, maintain this content. I like to organize things based on applications and usage. So again, furniture, appliances, uh, plumbing, lighting. I like to save things within those folders so that it's easy for me to locate and help people in those directions. Uh, if you have a network or a centralized location for storing your content, um, discuss with the teams that are using that, like how, how you guys need to set up those folders, making sure the appropriate people have access to that content. But it's very important to make sure that you consider your storage options uh, because we all, we all have a different situation. I can't really give you one. It, Solution because, again, we all have a different um, requirement for how we're going to use this content in the future. Uh, and then we need to test in a project. So testing in a project is actually, where did I find that? Here we go. Let's go to uh, first floor. Sure. Um, so this is not my project. If anybody would like it, it is a default in Revit. You just go and um, when you select new, you can go and just select one of these templates. Uh, let's say, let's go new. Oh, sorry. Open sample files. Super easy. And you can start here. I always recommend people new to family development to go and start there. Not all of these models are fantastic. Actually, a lot of them are unconstrained. Uh, some have imported geometry, um, but it at least gives you an idea of the requirements for that product. So I like to go in and just test. So this is, uh, does, does, the ch does, the, um, does it change in dimensions? So let's go eight by four, because I want something big. Okay, good. So the text changed. It updated. I saw the door update. Let's isolate this. <clears throat> so if I select it, we're going to see and isolate. Okay, so now did this model change in size? So I can go back and just try some other numbers. I know this might not be what I'm using. I just like to over constrain and test my content to make sure that there's no issues. So this one is a conflict with a wall. Okay, good. Is that related to the size of my door? No. So this, this warning is fine. This one's telling me that I'm going outside of an object um, and it's not a model specific issue. So yes, it's manipulated. What other options do we have in here? We've got materials. This one is very basic actually. So uh, panel, let's see if I can change that. Okay, let's just go to this red paint. We want something drastic. Okay, and did that change? Yes, the panel changed. So test your model in a project. Make sure that it's working 
as intended. Make sure you're seeing what you have actually created. Um, and if you're not, go back and visit. This, this model is a representation of yourself. You know, if you're going to hand this off to somebody and your material doesn't change, then what does that say about you when somebody is using your content? That you could even ensure that your models were accurately um, working in a project. I, you, you can't you can't deliver that type of uh, content to the industry. So just you know, be diligent, take your time, uh, pre-planning, and uh, testing. Lots of testing. Um, what else do we have? Right. I think I actually the end of my notes here. Uh, I did want to go over some of the product types just to kind of help people get in the direction of, well, I'm creating this. What does that mean in Revit? So um, if I have any object, pretty much needs materials. Uh, and that's a big thing on its own. Let's go to materials quickly. Because materials not only have colors, sorry, graphics, they have 2D patterns. They have um, images. So let's see if we can get an image here. Uh, this one. And they have images. Are you creating a material? Do you need to ensure that you have a pattern and a, um, a seamless image to accompany that material? Consider that. Uh, for graphics under patterns, uh, if nobody has used it before, there's a program called Pi Revit. It is amazing for creating 2D patterns within Revit. Super easy to use. Um, and will allow you to create your own custom patterns for your materials within Revit. And you can export it as an actual external document or you can maintain it within Revit. But I strongly suggest downloading Pi Revit. It has amazing features beyond just creating a pattern, which is this one section, but you can see all of the other options that it has available. Um, so I suggest downloading it and playing with it. You will you know, you would not be sorry for doing so. Then you get into the appearances and you have the seamless images. So you can download tons of this stuff off the internet. I think BIM Objects possibly has even created a material collection on their website. So content aggregators seem to be putting a lot of focus into the seamless imaging um, section of, of um, visual effects, visual graphics, uh, especially with the 3D, or especially with um, AR, VR, and other platforms. So the great thing about seamless images is that these are cross-platform um, functional. So because they're PNGs or JPEGs, I can actually use this in SketchUp, the exact same file. I can take that image and I can go over to AutoCAD and put it in their material collection. So there are a lot of resources for you for this stuff, but be careful because not everything is a seamless image. Um, and if you intend it to look, intend for it to look um, fantastic when you render it, make sure that it's clean um, and that uh, it's how you intend it to look. And then there's PBR. That's another form of, um, of imaging that you can use and provides you with various let's say layers of an image. So that just makes it more defined in your rendering. So if we have something that has bumps and texture, having a PBR imaging will, will it sandwiches multiple images together to create a more hyper-realistic rendering of your product. So do some research on how these are utilized and what you could do to enhance your skills. Um, and there's tons of resources out there. But again, most of the stuff you can download. Uh, it's, if you're doing something very specific, you have a brick coursing that you want at like some, you know, some pattern that's unique to you, you might have to create that. Uh, but if you're just looking for a standard running course or um, stacked bond, you probably can find that somewhere on the internet to use. Um, so make sure that you plan, make sure you understand what you're using uh, and what you want it to do. Um, some, other, some other file types. Um, so system families, that's something separate than the conversation that we've been having. We've been de dealing with family components, individual models that I can create this door and load it into a project. But Revit actually has a whole set of families that are specific 
to a project and you can save them. You can, you can interchange them through, uh, through projects, but they have to be developed within a Revit project. I can't create this as a separate family. So these are the wall systems, roof systems, floors, curtain walls, railings. Uh, what else do I have on my list? Um, yeah, finished facades, anything like that, anything that uh, would be utilized as a system family needs to be handled within Revit. So wall systems, they are all directed by material catalogs. So make sure that you understand how to use the material catalogs. Um, and it's, it's important to understand your thicknesses of products too. I've seen people give me a brick wall with a like, with a 10 foot brick wall, like the brick themselves to be 10 feet. That's not appropriate. <laughs> you know, go and do the research. What are you putting into this wall system? Um, the more information you put in, the more information could be extracted for third-party resources. So specifications and other disciplines that would utilize this. And also for, um, uh, what's that word? Uh, project life cycle, or is that what they're calling it now? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So, uh, and so if I'm going to be looking, this project is built and you can hand it off to pro or a, um, a manager, the, pro or the, the manager of the building after it's built, I can't think of the right word here. They actually utilize these models for um, the HVAC, for MEP, for all that kind of stuff. So the more accurate you can make your information, the longer lasting, the more, um, adaptable your content is to those other disciplines. Uh, other things to look into um, for system families is knowing the difference between them. So we've got the wall systems, floor systems, roofs, those are all the same, but then you get into like railing and um, curtain walls and they're a completely different um, ball game. So we've got, uh, you have the wall, the systems that actually utilize nested components. So you actually have to build the baluster. You have to build the handrail and input it into this model, into the project and build the system that you're looking for. And same with curtain wall systems, but with window or sorry, with walls and roofs, you're just applying the layers the, that sandwich that component together. But the railings and curtain walls, those are actual products. Those are um, have individual components that are required for them. So uh, if you're going to be developing a rail system or a curtain wall system, go and look some up, see how they're used, see what people are using for that and consider what uh, what options you might need to, to build those components. So again, for a curtain wall, you'd have an end frame, your center frames, you've got your glass panes, you might have a window or door uh, opening or yeah, opening into that. And yes, you can have a window in a curtain wall that actually opens and that's separate. That's an actual window that's loaded into that. That's not the curtain wall window. So understanding all of the requirements of the product that you're going to be creating is very important. Um, I was talking about multi-layer, multi-component families. So windows and doors, again, I have profiles. I have, um, uh, I have detail components and I have my window itself. Those are three different files that I need to create just to create that window. So even though my window, my door had a very square profile for the framing, I still created a profile because I might get a client in the future is like, but I want it to be my profile. I don't need to remake my model. I can just create their profile, load it into my model, make sure my frame widths and heights, you know, whatever parameters I set up to associate are appropriate and accurate, but I've set up my model that I can now accommodate any client. So think about those things when you're moving forward um, and it will help maintain your content for a longer, a longer period of time. Um, I think I might have everything covered. If anybody has any questions or. Um, yeah, I'm looking through the chat. I don't see any questions. Um, uh, Joyce, uh, your hand up. Did you have any questions you want to post in the chat? I don't know if you left your hand up. Um, uh, Donya. 
Do you have a question? Sorry, it's a mistake. I, oh. I click on the raise. Oh, we could, hold on. We can barely hear you. Go ahead. I say uh, it was a mistake for me. I raised uh, the hand. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, All right. Um, Don, you, did you say you have a question? Oh, oh, she on mute. Sorry. No worries. Uh, your chat is disabled. Is it really? Yes, I tried to put some chat in earlier. <laughs> like, um, for example, I wanted to ask, uh, Christina, when you are building these families and you talk about the things that you're going to have to have um, reporting up, the things you want to schedule, uh, do you provide a window or door tag, for example, uh, along with it, and do you provide them with the uh, shared parameter file if you create any sh new shared parameters? Ooh, that is an excellent question. <laughs> um, so it depends on the project. Uh, my focus for the last 20 years has been the content aggregator side. So most of the users downloading my content um, never took the, the, the tags uh, because they already have their own things set up. And uh, when I'm testing my models, I know that it will work with the default Revit systems. As for shared parameters, that is an excellent question because if nobody, if uh, some people aren't aware, shared parameters are not provided to you in Revit when you download it. You actually don't get anything. You have to start from scratch. Um, and I've been discussing with people releasing a, a standardized shared parameter document. Um, and you're kind of just adding fuel to that fire that it's probably, mm -hmm an appropriate direction to go um, because some people just don't know how to create them. Even though it is pretty straightforward, um, it can be, what's a good word? It could be um, intimidating trying to start yes. from scratch. Um, so that's why I keep very standard naming conventions when I'm creating something. So in case somebody already has their own um, shared parameter document that they can easily modify my file to match up to theirs. Uh, but I have never provided a shared doc or shared parameters document in the past, but it, it's definitely coming up as something I might move forward with in the future. Yeah, because if, if you're going to have a shared parameter file uh, and, and use some of the shared parameters, if you're going to have to have it in a schedule, it has to be a shared parameter. Yes. It can't be a family parameter. So, um, and I know there's some that typically come with some of the families. When you start with a door family, it's got some parameters in there that are easily already there and already can already be scheduled and stuff. But if you create anything different, I do know that I was in the food service industry for a while and they have a place where they can go and download the food service industry share parameter file. And the company I worked with started from that. So they didn't have to create everything from scratch. Um, and there are some places where you can get a basic shared parameter file to start with, so you don't have to start from scratch your own. But sometimes in the world of building families like this, I really hate to ha get in there and they got, and you, it goes, it's a shared parameter, and like, great, and I don't have the file, so I can't schedule it. So yes. that's something to put you know on the radar of people if they're building a library is be aware of, are you using shared parameters or family parameters? The only reason you need a shared parameter is schedules and tags often have to go along with it. Yeah, and, and data extraction. So if you're using yeah. like a Forge, sorry, it's not Forge anymore, uh, Autodesk um, <clears throat> platform solutions or something. <laughs> My bad for not remembering what it's called right now. They did just change it. Uh, so stuff like that, if you want to extract data for third-party applications, it also needs to be a shared parameter. So family parameters mm -hmm. just don't work as well. So um, great point. And I will... I pretty much have convinced me that I was on the right track by releasing shared parameters. So uh, if you can't find one or you don't know how to create one, just look up online quickly. You know, um, as Donia said that uh, she she was able to download one, download one for food services. And that's the direction to start. Am I looking for one for interior furniture? Maybe like uh, seating? Start there in your Google search or whatever your um, your search platform is, and there are a lot of options for you to start. But if you need to create one on your own, keep it simple. Like, don't sit there and try and come up with some like fifty alphanumeric code for labeling the width, just because you want it to say something fancy. Keep it 
you know, clean and consistent where other people can utilize it. And, um, as mentioned, if you want to schedule it, if you want to take it, if you want to pull it out for a specification, and even those, even the third party specification tools require you to have a shared parameter. Um, I like to, during my research portion, um, go and actually look up specifications and figure out what are the requirements for a specification for that product, because then that tells me what I possibly need to know and what is really important to that model. So if it's taken and passed on from to another discipline, what would they need from that? It's, you know, everybody kind of follows that specification format for a product's requirements, because if I'm going to ask Geldwin, Pella for this window, they want this specific information. So that's where I start when I'm developing a model. Um, I might review a few manufacturers or just a few specifications related to that product um, to figure out some of the requirements. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Anybody else has any questions? Um, it was a really good presentation. I learned a few things. So um, I have, a, I guess, a question. Um, you were talking about when somebody can get in there, let's say in, you're in Revit 2020, and then somebody this. opens it in 2022 and saves it. And let's say another person, another office opens up Revit 2021. Um, how do you tell, you know, I'm a beginner, what version you're about to open uh, a template or uh, a model? Um, so uh, you can add a, uh, I'm pretty sure it shows in shows. the model here. Let's, uh, let's go to the properties. Uh, it's or been a while give since- give you a warning that says, hey. It does, it does yeah. give you a warning, but I thought it used to show you, uh, Donya, you might wanna speak up. I'm pretty sure that would be something. So you used to be able to see what version it is, but if I try to open something that somebody had saved in 2022 in mine, then yes, I would get a warning that said that that was not compatible. Um, so that's, that is really important. If somebody's only going to be utilizing the model in a project, no problem, because they're not saving a new family. Yeah. Um, but if somebody does need content for a new family, I, I, I keep content libraries per version. So when a new version comes out, I'll actually copy everything that I had in 2020. And now I have a 2022 folder. And that's what I'll hand off to people. I'll ask them, what version are you using? What do you need? And they'll say, I'm using 2018. I'll be like, oh, oh, we need to go back a little bit further. But I don't, um, I don't continue developing beyond a certain part, I, I, beyond a certain point. I like to keep three versions back just so that I know that I can access a larger range of users. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not going to go and create everything that I've done this year in 2018. Mm -hmm. So your, your library is definitely more limited for previous years, but I, I just constantly, and you don't even have to upgrade them. I just make a new folder. And then when somebody <laughs> says that they want that file, I just give it to them. And yeah. then once they resave it, then it's just done for me. Yeah. Um, but there are tools you can use Dynamo to automate all that kind of stuff. Um, and that's into your project management, your, your BIM manager tools and resources, but. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah really good, good stuff there. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Any, yeah, that, that's really good. Anybody else have any questions? I know that she went up, she covered over a lot, but you know, really good, good stuff for people trying to create some standards for templates for Revit templates. Hey, Mark, go ahead. I think I unmuted, unmuted everybody. You can use your microphone, Mark, if you have a question. There we go. Yeah. Hey, Mark. How are you, Christina? I'm doing good. Very, very well done presentation. It was for a, a complete greenie to this stuff. It's amazing. Oh, what, a couple of things that stuck in my mind. You were talking about being able to export the finishes on surfaces from Revit to AutoCAD. You had mentioned that that's a possibility to export some of the some of the surface finishes. Oh, not export the surface finishes. So the materials themselves, those images that you create okay. that you okay, put so in, they're they're cross compatible because it's just a JPEG or a PNG. Now, dumb question. 
this window you have shown here, if I were going to AutoCAD, what what could I actually do with that within AutoCAD without creating all kinds of issues for myself? Is this something that AutoCAD is going to recognize as a viable entity, as more or less a block type thing? Uh, yes. So when you, um, sorry, guys, I've got to leave the meeting room that I'm in. So yeah. you guys have to watch me walk. I'm just going to. Just going to black out my screen. I'm still here, though. Okay. <laughs> um, so when you load content from Revit into AutoCAD, sorry, when you when you export from Revit, you're going to export uh, a DWG or another format that, that AutoCAD can use. But when you import it, yes, it comes in as a block. It comes in with faces. Um, and AutoCAD is non-manipulable in that sense. Like, you can't create a dynamic parametric 3d that, that was model. the next question yes yeah so uh but it is a good starting point um for content development um the processing from from revit to autocad uh it doesn't hold all that garbage oh if you want to process sorry i'm just uh finding a new office to go into people are gracious enough to donate their rooms to me <laughs> um that your content um, doesn't contain a lot of the garbage that that Revit likes to take in from, from AutoCAD or from third parties. So it's actually not too bad to go from one program to another um, if you're exporting your Revit. Um, go on, sorry. Okay. There's, because I see a lot of potential there for items that have been created in Revit that I, I know I'm in electrical and it's just kind of a, yeah, I'm not going to use a lot of windows and electrical, but I do like to play around with AutoCAD and some of this stuff. Yeah. And the faux pas is actually to Revit. So when you import into Revit, it's just, it might be an Autodesk software, but it is a completely own entity. Even, you know, when you're looking at it, when you're looking at my screen, um, that you know it's very familiar it's like you're using autocad a, like a beefed up version but it doesn't work the same you can't use the same controls you can't use the same commands um so it it really isn't the same software but the when you export from revit and you import into autocad it it's not the same it's it, it doesn't it's, it's, okay two it's different. cleaner yeah you can you i would prefer to go from revit to another software than bring software into Revit. or sorry bring another platform into revit it's just, it's not. Okay, because it, it, it looks like there's some potential for creating some really interesting entities, I can, as I'll call them with an AutoCAD term. Yeah. And it, like I said, I play with normal AutoCAD a lot. And I'm just wondering how much of a headache I'm going to get if I try to work from this, which looks very much more advanced than the 2D cartoons that I do. And try to work with it and see how well it's going to go. Yeah. So if you find a repository of Revit content um, that you'd like to utilize in AutoCAD, definitely. You might as well. Uh, if you need something that's dynamic, you wouldn't get 3D dynamic content in AutoCAD anyway. Oh, gosh, how I would love it. The parametric tools in AutoCAD actually manipulated 3D, but they don't. Um, but you do have like wall systems in Revit or sorry, in AutoCAD that are almost identical to the Revit wall system. So there are, you know, you can definitely see they're enhancing the AutoCAD capabilities. Um, so you can bring in those same images and have almost the identical wall in the systems. And, you know, this, this door, I can bring it into AutoCAD. Um, you'd have to reassociate the materials, I think. Uh, there might be an import um, tool that allows you to connect those. What am I saying? Of course, there's an import tool that'll help you do that. Um, you know, just making sure you had the right resources available for the import or just a little legwork. You might just need to clean something up, but it comes in as a solid block. If you explode it, um, I haven't done it in a long time. I'm not sure if it explodes each face or if it retains a 3D geometry. Um, so just, you know, be cautious. Could you ever, could you use burst as in with an electrical, which basically will retain the attributes for a particular entity? Explode makes a big mess. Yes. Burst will clean up a lot better. 
Yeah, like you're not going to be able to maintain attributes. Um, there is an attribute section in AutoCAD. I am investigating um, kind of its capabilities to see what you can do with that portion. Because like, I think it's more directed at the block attributes and not uh, wow. like a product attributes. But um, so you're not going to like, I'm. this isn't going to import in, in say this specific profile. It's going to import as that that frame geometry. Okay. Well, all right. Thank you very much for no your problem. Help. It's again very interesting to see some of the capabilities that I never even knew you could export. And I could, like I said, go into my 2D cartoons, I can almost actually use this. I'll, I'll yeah. quiet now that you get to your the rest of your questions. <laughs> Don't worry about it, Mark. I love your questions. They're great. <laughs> Amir, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you, uh, yep. Christina and Tony. Thank you. Thank you so much for your good presentation. I have a question regarding the, uh, you know, the AutoCAD e-transmission um, when we con complete the project. So you, we have the e-transmission, the uh, export the project. So there is uh, the Revit, they have any option from the e-transmit we, when we completed the project. So we will e-transmit and they uh, compress the one folder and send it to a uh, client or something. So yeah, there are tools out there. Uh, so that's project related. Uh, I don't have anything set up to demonstrate anything on that end. Uh, this was specific for family development. Um, uh, I'd have to... I'd have to go and do a little bit of research to give you a more appropriate answer. Um, but there are there are solutions for that in Revit. It might even be the same platform that AutoCAD uses. Don't hold me to that because uh, again, my um, expertise has has been very focused on the family development section and mm -hmm. interaction with the project and not um, you know the full project releasing it to a client at the end. So um, uh, I would have to do a little bit of research to answer that pro that properly, but uh, I, I know that there are extraction tools like that. I just don't know the name of them eh, or how to use them at this point. Yeah. Um, Don, uh, Donya, do you know? I don't know if, you know. Yeah, actually, Donya might know. Um, I don't know if she's, if she's still online, but I don't know if she's out there. Can you repeat the question, please? If there's some kind of uh, e-transmit version for, you know, AutoCAD has an e-transmit when you're doing like as built or sharing a third party uh, to a third party, the actual um, drawings, does Revit have anything like similar to e-transmit? You know, I don't know because we most of the time we're sharing all of our uh, projects with the consultants um, on the BIM 360 or yeah. Artist, construction documents, whatever. So, so when you are sharing, you're sharing everything. You don't actually like gut stuff out that they don't, the client doesn't need to see, or you don't want to share stuff that's part of a template. You don't actually kind of purge stuff out of there. Um, typically no. Mm. Yeah, I know because our end, you know, on the civil side, I'm on the civil side. So if I'm going to share something to client, we'll actually export it uh, to an AutoCAD. We don't give them the actual civil 3D file. Well, we appreciate that too, considering <laughs> the size of this. Yeah, and and that way, you know, because if if we just give them the CB three D model, what happens is what typically happens. You know, you know, those developers have other engineering companies. You're essentially just giving them your civil three D template, and then they'll turn yes. around and say, hey, we did this project. Here's the CAD file, and then you're sharing that client will share that right. civil three D template to the other engineering company and stuff. And I always tell young you know, EITs or engineers, hey. You can't just share the model because there's like seals, digital seals in there, important uh -huh. things in there that the client doesn't need to, and you really doesn't need to see. Um, so we always go in there and purge it, explode it, and then give them the the kind of the 2D. We don't give them the 3D file. We give them the 2D version of the pipes, the grading, the surfaces and stuff like mm. that. Well, that's funny um, because if we were going to limit what they get, mm -hmm. all they need is the 3D model to reference into their file. Mm -hmm. So I have worked where we have saved out and detached a model mm -hmm. because we always work in central models Yeah, and saved out and detached, go into a 3D view and then kill everything else. Remove all sheets, legends, yeah. schedules, uh, all other views, 
Mm -hmm. uh, purge the bejeevers out of it, which gets all of your seals and signatures and mm -hmm. things like that out of it. And then share with them a detached model. Mm -hmm. is what it's, Generally, you'll see it with the word underscore detached at the end yeah. of it. Mm -hmm. And you share that with some uh, group. I've, I've had, had where we use some companies mm -hmm. that we that I've worked with where we would share that with them. Mm -hmm. And then we would give them the PDF sheets. Yeah. That had everything on it. So it would be a separate model. So there's two aspects that I've worked with. One where you scrub it, deta detach it and scrub it. Mm -hmm. And one where you just go, oh, yeah, come on in. We're all in here together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think I know that might be standard process for yeah. the Reddit that just everybody party in the same pool. <laughs> yeah. But when it came down, especially to uh, some clients when I was at, in food service, uh, when you're working with a chain restaurant, some of them gets very particular about what is out there that can be grabbed. And so those are the ones we basically did a detach with. Mm -hmm. I know when I'm coordinating with the architecture company, if I'm building a simple 3D model like an InfoWorks, uh, I'll usually tell the architect, okay, don't give me the, 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 the full 3D model. Give me the shell, the outer shell of that building. And then it's mm. a much smaller version. Mm -hmm. And if I was you know, on that side, I guess that's how I would probably share it to uh, the client is the outer shell and then the floor plan, 2D floor plan, and then a PDF. <laughs> that's what I would do. Uh, yeah, that's, that's an interesting process. Like you have that separate file just for that specific purpose. Mm -hmm. And then if you need to edit it, you have your version that you can go back into and, and yes. manipulate it. So um, yeah, Amir, I, sounds like there's a few techniques that you can use, uh, but you know, do a little bit of research and find out what solution you require. Um, and you know, check out the Autodesk um, um, forms. I'm sure there's a lot of people that have posted stuff on there and uh, um, you know, and if you find an answer, make sure that you, you know, promote it and help other people find that solution as well. Because we're all learning yeah, constantly. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're gonna stop here the the webinar. I think uh, we everybody's gotta get back to <laughs> back to work. Uh, uh, for all our attendees, if you're not part of our um, online user group, you know, uh, uh, Danya, Mark, um, and Christina is part of our uh, online user group, the DFW BIM Infrastructure User Group. You'll see me posting all the time on, on uh, LinkedIn. Um, all you need to go is go on to the MeWe.com uh, platform, and we have an online user group there. Um, and then ask to join. The D Just look for, search for DFW BIUG, and then ask to join, and that's where we're at daily you know most of us are on there daily just networking sharing ideas sharing tips and tricks you can find christina's you can find also donya's tips you can find i think mark's actually posting some tips on there on the autocad side and uh, um, the electrical side too so we have various cad managers bin managers some of few autodesk people on there um and you know, across multiple um industries they're sharing and networking on there so if you haven't joined come join us i mean we're on there every day we have two to three you know, probably two webinars a month. We have trivia. Um, so yeah, definitely come join. Just go to, to uh, mewe.com or you can type in DFW BIUG. That's BIM Infrastructure User Group.com. That's our website. And there's a link there to join the, uh, the MeWe. And uh, it's free to join. And, and I would definitely, definitely download the mobile app. That's what most of our members are using the mobile app. There is not a desktop version. That way you get notifications about webinars such as these like this. Um, this has been recorded. We'll upload it maybe by Friday or, or Thursday. I'll have it uploaded on our YouTube channel. Um, but I want to thank everybody for joining us and uh, and uh, be looking for the next webinar. Probably next, I think in two weeks we have another one. So, um, and oh, Christina, if somebody wants to follow you or any kind of social media, you know, they want to follow you on on, on LinkedIn or something. You, you know, how do they oh, follow yeah. you? Uh, so very easy. Uh, LinkedIn would be the only place to find me, at least at this point, or on the MeWe app with uh, Tony and Donia and Mark. Uh, but just look up Christina Youngblood. My name does start with a K, not a CH. Uh, that's common. Uh, <laughs> and uh, feel free to follow me or, um, you know, um, ask me questions on there. Um, if you have, if you get stuck in your Revit family development and you don't know how to get out of it, or you get a warning you can't figure out, shoot me a yeah. message. It might take me a little bit sometimes just depending on my personal workload hey we all have jobs uh but i'll definitely get back to you yeah mark did you have a question before you get off um did you mention the community conversations christina 
Oh, right. Yes. So we also, um, Tony, myself, uh, Donia and Mark are actually also part of the Autodesk community blog. And you can look that up as well. Just look up Autodesk community blog and uh, there are great tips and tricks and uh, uh, solutions related to various Autodesk platform and Autodesk programs as well on there. So. Yes, I forgot that I was on there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, everyone, have, I hope everyone has a great week. Thanks for joining us, and we will see you again. Thank you, Tony, and thanks for helping me get this started. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you have a great afternoon, guys. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, Bye. Sorry, Bye. could you re-mention the platform where uh, the BMW? Yeah, uh, DFW BIUG. Yeah, that stands okay. for DFW. That's the city DFW Dallas area, and then B for BIM Infrastructure User Group. That's what it stands for. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah, you very much. Right. Have a great yes. day, everyone. Thanks.